commissioned for the occasion of Printed Matter and Exile Books published a section at Not in Miami last um, December. We hope you'll join us each Tuesday this month to learn more about the creative development of these digitally native publishing projects. I'm uh, well, um, pleased to welcome this evening uh, curator Vanessa Apia and designer Jess Katabarwa uh, of Afilasi and publisher Harley Smart of Antism Books. A uh, special thank you to the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation for its extreme uh, support, tremendous support of the dynamic online presence of printed matter and exile books. Sorry for all this pinging. <laughs> Apologies. Um, at Not of Miami, including the commissions of the four, on four online projects and this month's program series. Uh, we welcome you to visit artistbooksmiami.org to engage directly with these pro programs um, and these projects and learn more about the entire presentation that took place in Miami. Um, we also, uh, I think we're dropping some links in the uh, chat box right now, as well as on YouTube. And just a few notes to begin with. Um, feel free to say hi to us in the chat box. Let us know that you're here, that you're listening, where you're listening from. Uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A section of the Zoom or in the comments on YouTube. We'll have some time towards the end of the program to answer any questions or open up space for discussion. And if you'd like to watch this program with closed captions, please click uh, the link in the chat right now, which will direct you to our YouTube channel where the program is also being live streamed and includes auto-generated captions. Thank you again for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, before we start, we definitely want to say thank you to Printed Matter for highlighting our digital library. Um, it was such a pleasure to meet you guys and uh, the rest of your team at NADA Miami. Um, we also want to thank Mobile Coin Art for recognizing our project as we uh, won a prize um, for the importance of highlighting uh, privacy. Um, and yeah, we're super excited, super grateful for the opportunity to extend the conversation we started in 2020 with a bigger and new audience. Um, so before we get into it, uh, we'll start by quickly presenting ourselves and letting you guys know what Afilasi is. So I'll start. I'm Vanessa. I'm uh, the researcher, curator, and editor of Afilasi, and I specialize in the theoretical understandings within fields of African studies and film studies. I did a double BA within these two disciplines and currently now I'm working on my MA thesis that's exploring the visual representations of eroticism in sub-Saharan African cinema. Um, I'm really interested in visual culture as a whole. I'm interested in the place and the power of spectatorship, uh, the role of the visual field and how we construct culture. How about you, Jess? Hi, thank you, Vanessa. Um, I'm Jess Katabawa, co-founder of Afilasi, artist, designer, visual communicator, uh, also organizer uh, for uh, exhibitions with Vanessa. Um, uh, I'm interested in uh, visual, visual references and mix them with literary references to create new narrative embedded in contemporary lives, especially of, the, uh, of, of marginal uh, people and racialized bodies. Um, so I'll start talking about like the, the first uh, idea and the first uh, conception of Afilasi. So some of the ideas we, we've uh, developed with Afilasi came originally from 2015 and I was organizing this uh, digital uh, native uh, publication and uh, through that experience, I invited artists, designers, writers, and uh, yeah, artists, designers, yeah, to collaborate and create uh, 
a publication on mainstream media and how it, how it project on racialized bodies. Uh, unfortunately, this project didn't come to fruition, but uh, it was a nice experience for me to know uh, what's needed in terms of organizing a digital native uh, platform. So forward a few years later, uh, made a, uh, I reacquainted myself with Vanessa. We first met uh, like uh, at a at, at a, a magazine yeah. launch, right? Yeah, like at a at an event at a party here in Montreal. Yeah, and basically, uh, it took a few years that we started talking about maybe doing something digital about Afrocentric references and mix them with uh, uh, images. Um, so yeah, when I reacquainted with Vanessa, I was really interested with her, her, uh, her academic background and her historical Afrocentric references. And I, I thought with my uh, visual uh, skill set, and design skill set, we would be a really good team to work together. Uh, maybe Vanessa, do you want to talk about the origin of the name? Yeah, so Afilasi is actually an anagram of both of our maiden names. So um, Afi is my mother's name. Um, it's also my middle name. And Lassi comes from Umilisa, which is Jess's uh, mother's name. Um, but we did a play on words on that. And then um, we later find, found out that in native Samoan, just by like Googling it when we, we figured we liked the name, um, that in native Samoan, it means affiliation. And that was a really nice surprise because it um, comes to the root of what we're trying to do with this digital platform. Um, we're trying to use the power of the digital sphere to create some kind of underground network, some like a, a form of community that's grounded in fact-based knowledge. But it was really always important for us um, that this collective database that we're growing uh, remains uh, rooted in objectivity. So you could kind of see, um, hope everyone could see, yeah. Um, so, uh, just could kind of tell you guys more about the logo and the typography that he worked on, but I'll I'll kind of kind of describe what Afilasi's um, main goals are. Um, we started because we want to give more access to the literary references, uh, especially that I was encountering during my undergrad in African studies. I was realizing that there was so many. Uh, books, so many articles that aren't part of our universal library. Um, so we wanted to use this platform to promote that circulation and create new narratives uh, through the relationship with visual images and found literary references. Um, it's an open source uh, platform, uh, just we'll go through it in a bit, but um, the idea is that through this sense of community, it deconstructs the hierarchies in access to knowledge. Um, also, the digital form makes it pocket-sized and accessible and practical, a practical way to um, engage with Black um, cultural productions. Um, so Jess will kind of bring you guys through our website. So like Vanessa said, uh, the, the logo mark, I feel I see, is uh, an anagram of our mother's maiden name and also mean affiliation in Samoan. And uh, one thing I wanted to highlight uh, is like the affiliation of images with literary references, which is the new narrative we're trying to come up with this website. Um, and from the maiden name Afi to Lassi, we have a ligature that sort of encapsulate the I and create this kind of, you, it might be a little stretch to say that, but create some kind of a womb uh, and protect the eye, uh, the self, and we're trying to build uh, safe uh, space and communities. So if I scroll down, here you can see there's an upload button and you can uh, write a title of 
an extract, uh, copy paste the extract you want to reference, source the extract link, your name or alias, upload a media uh, as so, uh, source of an image as well. We want all the content to be uh, credited and sourced. Uh, se select a country and then enter some keywords to uh, that, that are relevant to your uh, the extract you're trying to post on the platform. So once you've done that, the article uh, is set, is uh, sorted by date. So this is the last post we, we've uh, published on the platform. This is uh, artist Pegnosis and an article about mental health. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so we have a few, we have a few uh, collaborators internationally, but I, I think we still want to uh, uh, have more engagement on the platform while staying kind of low key about it. Uh, we definitely invite everyone to uh, participate in building this collective database. Um, so we'll go to talk to you guys about uh, what led to the exhibition of Black Experience Isn't a Spectacle? Yeah, uh, so, so the, the origin of the, our exhibition, Black Experience Isn't a Spectacle, in 2020 at Antheism, uh, I would love to thank, thankfully thank, thankfully thank <laughs> you, uh, Antheism, for your constant support in our project and seeing value in our platform. So uh, we got introduced with Antheism through a collective, uh, our art collective named Boiling Point, we, which were facilitators within the process. Um, yeah, the, yeah, uh, Vanessa? So uh, I'll give you guys the curatorial foundation of where my head was at when I was trying to conceptualize Black experiences in a spectacle. Um, in general, it intends to exist as a restorative gesture that explores the legacy of the voyeuristic gaze in visual representations upon the Black body. So as Jess was saying, we got offered the opportunity and space to do this exhibition uh, facilitated by Boiling Point um, after the summer of 2020. And that collective was formed as a response to the unfortunate happenings surrounding the death of George Floyd. Uh, as we all know, there was a global interest in making spaces and hearing Black voices. Um, so as I mentioned in my intro, I'm really interested in the place that spectatorship holds. Um, and I like to think that spectatorship is as active as um, the performance or is as active of an act as whatever is being exhibited. Um, I think that there is an immense power in looking. Um, and with that nine minute piece of video that uh, went universal, for me, it exemplified the historical exhibitionism of the black body, um, even until its eminent death. So this brought me back to uh, the, a, a lot of studies I did in African cinema, and it brought me back to the very first images of the black body with a project by the, Lum the Lumiere brothers. Um, black experience is in a spectacle kind of merges two of my worlds, uh, African studies and film studies. And coming from a background in cinema uh, and even in our popular culture discourse around the cinema, uh, the invention of the cinema is really glorified. Um, the story of the Lumière brothers has such a awe and amazement around it. Um, don't get me wrong, I definitely love this medium. I think we could all attest to the transformative magic that the moving, the moving image, images have on our culture. Um, but we often fail to realize that the invention of cinema, the cinematic lens itself, was an, an enabling tool and an essential tool for the process of visually othering the Black body. Um, so the historical roots of that first encounter of black, black bodies with the camera 
um, they kind of inform today's standing traditions of how we visualize Black bodies. So conceptually, Black experience isn't a spectacle comes in the conjunction of two main historical events. The first being the cinema of attraction, uh, which uh, during the colonial period, so in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, the scramble for Africa, the beginning of the conquering of the continent happens at the same time as the invention of the cinema. So the new art form of film was in its really early stages. And in film history, we refer to that time as the cinema of attractions. Um, this film style emerged with a focus on the act of showing and exhibition. It stripped the craft to its core. And it was a period that was uh, representing the unique power of the, uh, of the photographic image, uh, its power of harnessing visibility. Um, and the second historical event um, that grounds this show is the first time Sub-Saharan Africans were subjected to the cinematic lens. This was in the context of fulfilling the Western voyeuristic gaze. So in 1896, the Lumière brothers, after they solidified their project behind the invention of the moving image, they started traveling the world and um, took a group of Ashanti people from the Gold Coast, which is today's Ghana. I also happen to be a descendant of the Ashanti people. So learning this really hit different. And they started shooting a series of 14 films. Um, these were films, um, you see the images, these, um, the images that you see are takes from those films that are quite rare to get access to again nowadays. But um, these are people who were imported to perform in French human zoos. And um, the Lumière brothers would kind of set up mock villages and set up um, performances. They'll say, for example, uh, starve the group for a whole day and then throw a small bowl of food. And uh, the visualization of them running towards the food gave great pleasure to European audiences. They would do dances, um, they would make them clean, just different mundane activities. And the mere visuality of the body on the screen um, gathered large amounts of crowds in front of the screens. So the interest of the cinema of attractions was to incite visual curiosity and supply pleasure through an exciting spectacle. And that's what the black body represented for its European spectators. Um, I, I am heavily inspired by the work of Nicholas Mirzoff and Nicole Fleetwood when I was conceptualizing this show um, because they talk about how this right to look, this harnessing of visibility is a, a process that's both intersubjective but implies a distance and you're able to other um, you're able to other an image when you have a distance between it and when its physical differences um, are the only points that you're referring from. So for Sub-Saharan African people and their descendants, this history of visuality was a project of intrusion. Um, indeed, much is to be said on the visually arresting nature of black individuals. Um, the visual field itself is racial formation. The visual sphere is a performative one where seeing race is, is an active act. So just is gonna show some images from our exhibition. Um, so if black experience is an a spectacle, my main argument was that mere visual representation, uh, having black bodies on the in our visual sphere isn't the solution, it, it isn't the answer. Um, our concern with mere uh, Black iconicity um, today has resulted in a flooding of images of Black hair, of Black bodies. And today's heavy, simplistic reliance on visual narratives um, doesn't get to the heart of the Black experience. Um, this false expectation that representation itself uh, will resolve the problem of the black body in the field of vision only encourages normative discourse. And I'll quote Nicole Fleetwood who says, accordingly blackness becomes visually knowable through its performance. 
So Black life becomes intelligible and valued, yet also consumable and disposable. In this sense, Blackness circulates, but isn't rooted in a history. So in the conjunction of what we're trying to do with our, our library, having um, cultural uh, engagement with African uh, cultural production that's rooted in knowledge, that's rooted in objectivity, we were able to bring our digital library to real life um, in September 2020. Um, and it was able to attest for all these historical dynamics I talked about um, result in today's um, engagement with the Black body and how we see the Black body. Um, Black livability goes beyond its reductions to exhibitionism, scrutiny, fetishization, and an entertaining provision for the intruder's gaze. Whether in film, music, sports, or even until the visualization of its slaughter, Black bodies are put on constant display and subjected to voyeurism. Our title centers on the concept of spectatorship as we aim to redefine how we look, how we spectate, and how we culturally consume Blackness. So my response to that was to combine the spatial elements of a visual art gallery and a reading and study room. Um, our exhibition offered a landscape of what I like to call counter visualities, and this is a term I borrowed from Nicholas Mirza. Um, so beyond the iconographic representation, our audiences were able to engage with Afrocentricity through the productions of thought um, with three curated libraries that revealed itself as past, present, and future, the pre-colonial, the diasporic, and the Afrofuturist. And each collection interacted with image sequencing, print, audiovisual, as well as through physical embodiment with Bantu architectural sculptures. Um, so the first way we kind of use art to be a counter visuality is uh, through the collection um, by the amazing Tanya Dumbe Fines and Elodie Deron, entitled Ibiani. Um, so those are who you see, the artists you see on the screen here. Um, Ibiane is the name of an ongoing conversation around furniture designed and handcrafted by Elodie Deron and Tania dumbe -Fines. Their studio is now based in Martinique in the Caribbean. Um, so we had uh, such an honor to offer them space to debut their collection of furniture. Our visitors were able to come in the space, sit um, in uh, furniture that's designed uh, based on traditional African conceptions of the body. And within the space, Ibiane um, was paired with a curated library. The, co the collection extensively stimulates engagement with self and independence in thought. Through Bantu design languages, they created dialogue with modern Western consumption of furniture, a reflection of their deeply rooted hyphenated identity. Deron and Finesse practice within traditional methods of craftsmanship and all that that entails, patience, mindfulness, and a total engagement of the body and spirit. They work in symbiosis and their dexterity truly embodies what Ibiane means in native Batanga, to know one another. They use wood as their only material and these chairs come to being uh, with the least industrial methods of assembly. Uh, so Jess and I will kind of uh, bring you through those three collections I, I, I described, um, the pre-colonial, the, the diasporic and the Afrofuturist. Um, so the first collection, I selected a, a, a number of books um, that were all foundational texts within the disciplines of African studies. Uh, they encounter a lot of mainstream perspectives that are based on colonial pseudoscientific ideals on the Black body. And uh, that's what Jess's work, Body Qualm, is, explores. With that collection, uh, the main chair was the, birth the birthing chair. Um, this chair is really symbolic for us as it represents 
the beginning of this uh, exhibition, the beginning of the Ibiani collection. And it's also um, pre-colonially, it was a chair that was used um, to assist women in giving birth. It was the most natural posture uh, during childbirth. Um, it's also intended to provide balance and support. Um, its origins can be traced to Egypt. And today it's really associated with Western Africa. And um, these chairs are really uh, um, significant for families as they'll be passed down, down the maternal uh, family line. Uh, associated with uh, that collection of book, um, the birthing chair just created an artwork called Body Qualm that he'll present. Okay, so Body Qualm was first conceptualized back in 2015. Um, it sort of like started my whole journey into trying to describe the feeling of the projection that whiteness project on black bodies, especially the male body. And uh, from that, uh, from, from, uh, from, that uh, from these motives to express those immaterial things, I, 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 I try to find a, a way to visualize uh, those dogmas to make them palpable and uh, to maybe like in a sense to know your enemy in a sense. Um, so basically, uh, I created the first, um, and when I say whiteness, not necessarily white people, is just the, the whiteness being like the, the dogma of seeing what Caucasian as purity, as the racial superiority. So uh, in, uh, so body calm is divided in two pieces as a diptych. You have whiteness, and body uh, black stigmas. So, um, so yeah, uh, whiteness is quite, uh, it's quite, it's like a collage of different symbolism of seeing whiteness as purity, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, use uh, some uh, white colors, etc. And for, Black stigmas are sort of from the lens of whiteness, which project a, ident uh, a definition of the black male body, which are uh, hyperphysicality, hypersexual, uh, beastie, evil, uh, ominous, violent, etc. So uh, in, within that process, it was uh, exhibiting this. Uh, this piece from that was conceptualized several years ago, it sort of uh, was kind of a healing process to do to sort of like uh, not be defined by that projection and sort of uh, heal from uh, those experiences. Yeah, you can go ahead. Um, so next we had collection two, which is the collection that covered the diasporic narrative. So I chose a collection of books and articles that encapsulated literary works written by, by the African diaspora and on the African diasporic experience. It situated blackness within the Western space where feelings of displacement that Jess's artwork diaspora embodies and are explored. This collection was um, attributed to three chairs, Elambe four, five, and eight. And these are three chairs that fusions modern Western design conceptions, as well as traditional Bantu ones. So Jess will kind of tell you more about his artwork, Diaspora. So Diaspora is, uh, is better understood in person uh, in, in the space as the materiality of the piece, the art piece, sort of create a dialogue between the art piece itself and the viewer. Uh, so, so depending of the viewer uh, racial identity, the reflection, the gaze being reflected upon yourself from the art piece 
sort of create different dialogue within yourself, depending of your racial background. So diaspora is basically uh, a, uh, a combination of two different words, which are diaspora and dysphoria. Uh, I'll read quickly the definition, the unease or feeling of having no sense of home, forever displaced, forever the other, without any sense of self, a blurred identity and dismantling of the body. So this piece as well was made uh, in 2016. And um, again, a bit like uh, uh, the, the uh, body qualm, it was uh, very healing to exhibit uh, this art piece, uh, art piece uh, <laughs> publicly. So lastly, um, our collection three looks, takes a look in the horizon and uh, centered Afro, uh, texts that are based in Afrofuturist theories. Um, it's concerned with the non-monolithic contemporary realities of Blackness. And it was paired with two artworks, um, both with the name Otter, a play on the word other. Uh, one is a audiovisual. Uh, we'll we'll uh, show you a clip. And then the other is a printed piece. Um, both of these pieces have kind of an ending of hope for eternal Black sustainability. Um, so we'll show you a bit of other. But you don't need to, okay. So uh, this is the digital platform we, we've done with uh, Antes and Fonada and Printed Matter. So I'll just scroll down uh, quickly to the video. Um, So for this uh, for this art piece Sorry. Okay. So for this art piece, um, okay, for this art piece, we which was an early collaborative effort. Um, why am I here? Okay. So for this art piece, which was an early collaborative effort. Uh, we source uh, most of the images and uh, source most of the images and uh, the, the soundtrack be made by uh, multi-instrumentalists Tati, Umia and Uri, originally from Montreal, uh, but now having worked internationally. Uh, we also add on the 3D animation uh, Christian Boache. Boache. Sorry, Chris. Uh, on the 3D animation. And, uh, um, and uh, myself uh, organizing the process with Vanessa and creating the images with uh, Daudaka and Sona Sadio. Uh, so, so may, now I, I would invite uh, Vanessa to talk about uh, some of uh, my favorite moments in the video. Um, so the clip we're going to show is an um, uh, awesome kind of crash that Chris worked on. It merges um, an iconic Senegalese film called Tukibuki by Jibril Diop Mambeti. 
Um, it's a film that was made in the early 70s. And as I was uh, saying, I'm doing my MA thesis on the erotic representations of the Black body in African cinema. And uh, Tukibuki is a really emblematic way of what I would exemplify as a counter visuality. It, um, it shows us an erotic experience without directly uh, viewing the Black body. Uh, the director, Jibril Ziyab Mambeti, kind of finds ways to use nature um, as a visual metaphor to show the erotic experience. This was paired by a beautiful poem by Bill Guns <clears throat> that was um, uh, recited in the film Ganja and Hess. Um, I thought uh, on a film history perspective, it was really interesting how both of these films came out in the same year one in Black America and one in, on the African continent. And I kind of just wanted to bring them both together within one space. So that was, so that was, that was, that was a, a clip from audiovisual. Audio um, we'll talk a bit about its, uh, its assisting piece, um, Otter Print. Yeah. OK, so. Um, uh, other print uh, was meant to be uh, exhibited in the space, but also in the spaces of the community buying the prints. 
And um, basically this art piece was may enabled us to finance the, our first exhibition. Uh, so uh, as well as uh, the audiovisual part of things, uh, other print was uh, Ali uh, was sourcing its images for the most, most part and making a collage and creating narrative between images by that ju juxtaposition, juxtaposi juxtaposi by juxtaposing those images. Um, so from that, uh, I really wanted to explore like yes, the highly branded aesthetic that are mostly found in commercial space, but use that language for something that's non-commercial. Um, hence like the very, uh, very uh, easy pun to do with other, uh, other. Um, so I really wanted to explore like the dynamics between uh, uh, visual identities in the, the uh, branding commercial way, but having a narrative that is not embedded in a commercial space. So, so uh, these are some of the close-ups. Um, and we have a quick video just to show uh, just to show that every print on the, on its uh, recto, on its verso, on its back, on its back, as all the literary references of the exhibition, of the audiovisual as well as the collection. So to st to keep the communal sense of the art piece, uh, members of the community uh, can get uh, a glimpse of the exhibition by buying this print and having all the references listed on the backside of this print. Um, so this is a good place to lead on to the release of our catalog for the exhibition. Um, in the same kind of sense that the back of um, Otter the print um, had all the, ref the referential tools um, to access films, uh, literary references, and other cultural productions of um, authors of African descent. Um, we wanted our catalog to uh, embody our exhibition, our digital library, all in one space. Um, so we have a copy here. Um, just can talk a bit about uh, his idea behind the design. I can see you all, yeah. Just we'll talk a bit about his idea behind the design. So uh, what we really wanted to explore a bit uh, as we explore with the tree collection, uh, this idea of the past, present, and future. So uh, we basically add references of ancient tombs with like an emboss finish with the logo mark, and as well as references to maybe uh, 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 a monolith that came from space, for example, that object that is uh, that is mysterious. We that is mysterious from uh, its appearance, but that is actually a tool for uh, knowledge and uh, uh, yeah, a tool for knowledge. So uh, within the book, it would encapsulate kind of a course pack um, and have uh, within the structure of the exhibition, um, collection one, two, and three, and it would be a referential tool, a pocket-sized referential tool for people to access articles that are not easy to access. Um, and this is what our online platform does within itself as well. So uh, as Printed Matter invited us to Nada Miami and sponsored this web platform, um, we kind of follow through to the journey that we kind of took you through for this whole exhibition. For example, if I take the collection to um, this collection, uh, uh, that's collection two, two, three. Three, sorry. Um, you have titles here, and you could easily access uh, any title that you that we have. Um, we wanted to be open access and 
practical to refer to. These are um, more fun foundational texts from collection one. Um, so we have poetry, we have um, also more academic uh, texts. So again, um, we just wanna keep promoting um, accessibility to Afro-descendant uh, cultural productions. Um, I don't know if Harley wants to talk a bit more about the plugin that we have on our site. Hello. Hi there, hi everyone. Um, no, thanks Vanessa. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you to everyone, uh, Printed Matter team, Sanel and Sanjana. We really appreciate everything and the, the, the opportunity to, to work on this, pro uh, this special. Uh, myself and uh, uh, the team at Antism, we were excited to work and collaborate with Jesse and Vanessa on this. And uh, one, one uh, aspect that we were able to support and work on was this, uh, the function of open annotation on this web page here. So we, uh, this is a reflection, this page here we're scrolling through is a, you know, a, an imprint of the, the fuller, the larger site, the Appalachian site and that digital library here. But on this page, which will, I'll add a link in the chat. Um, it has this ability to uh, annotate anywhere on the page. So um, specifically on the one web page here, but as you read through, you can comment on any single word, any idea, any anywhere throughout any image. So this, uh, this function is made possible through a uh, platform called Hypothesis. It's mainly a, an academic um, uh, service or use. It's open source and the idea of annotating the web or everything and this an entire layer across the web and any web page PDF uh, and content that makes it possible to go in and start uh, comment threads throughout. So we're not lo looking to the end of a web page to, to sift through comments to find something that might be relevant or your interest, where here you can really stop on anything that really catches your interest and leave a comment uh, in real time or through time, engage with people uh, that are, you know, that have, that, uh, you know, have conversation there in community. So uh, I think I'll just leave it there. I'm gonna leave a, a link to this page if anybody's interested. And, um, yeah, thanks again to Printed Matter. And um, yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Um, so that would conclude our uh, presentation, our panel. Um, we definitely want to invite uh, questions, uh, comments, suggestions. Um, Oh, we have a question. I think Carly could uh, answer. A technical question. Can you please see more about this platform hypothesis? Challenges, benefits, et cetera, web designer necessary. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, let me see if I can just share my screen for a second. Um, Jesse, is that possible? All right, so, I mean, I just have a couple of slides here. I mean, uh, I was doing my own research in my, uh, in my grad program on annotation, and um, I was interested in building it into augmented reality applications with previously printed books, which is a, uh, another topic. But um, uh, yeah, just looking into this history, I mean, this long history of basically writing in the margins of books, you know, when you're finding old scribed, written notes, graffiti, whatever, this sort of thing. So like you know fast forward to our you know the present day and how we're engaging and communicating uh mainly in comment sections on on pages like this or you know uh, um having this ability to have this layer on top where we can go and and add, um add html content images anything and have threads happening so that this is achieved by uh, essentially just adding it embedding a plugin to your site uh, personally, I didn't, I didn't take care of the technical aspect of this, but it w really was very, very simple from what I saw. 
and it really just is copying this into the code of your page. So it is a hypothesis. Um, Let's see, hypothesis, yeah, one of their goals is like really annotating, annotating knowledge, annotating, uh, annotating the web and uh, doing this collectively. Um, so social reading across PDFs, web pages, even publications. Um, so th yeah, hypothesis.com, I believe, but uh, it, it's really simple. It, it's a free service and it essentially is just logging in and adding this to your page. If you do a create an account, you'll be able to follow along and join in other pages where it's been added. And I think gradually this should perhaps become much more common and across the web. I hope that helps. Thanks, Harley. Uh, we have another question by Amanda. Will you, will you leave Afilasi uh, site open for submission indefinitely? Uh, it's coded by Jess, so I'll let you answer that. Uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's an open conversation between uh, me and Vanessa. Uh, but it's true that if the traffic gets very uh, high, we might have to change some, uh, some stuff on, on, um, on the platform, at least uh, like a review process. We do review every content. Uh, but like if the traffic get very substantial, uh, we might need new tools to, uh, and maybe even a bigger database because uh, the current database is, uh, is for uh, a smaller uh, backend website. So yeah, uh, I hope it answered the question. Uh, do you have any other questions? Anyone else have any questions? Um, so I guess that's it for the questions. Thank you everyone who attended. Um, it's been such a pleasure to share our project with everyone and we look forward to seeing you digitally. Oh, yeah. it looks like there's one little question from someone named Daniel. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't see it. Oh, maybe Go ahead, Daniel. I think someone in the chat just said, I have a question. Oh. Oh. Just <laughs> You can uh, either type it in the chat or you can type it in the Q&A, um, Daniel. Yeah, uh, I, I see. Maybe not. <laughs> ah. What's the best way to approach the study of African history? Um, that's a really good question. Um, since there's so much. Um, that's a really good question. I would say uh, approach it with objectivity as any uh, research other uh, history that you research. Um, there is so much, but in some sense, there is so little because um, the, the official uh, start of African studies as a discipline only started around the 50s. Um, so before that, um, the studies of African studies wasn't by African people. And even in its early stages, um, it was mostly European universities that uh, took on a lot of the research. Um, so that's one thing I would say definitely would be um, if you're researching African history, try to find um, try to find authors that are African or of African descent, um, which you'll find out is actually harder than it, it might seem. Um, I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're having more questions. What will you do with Mobile Coin Art Prize? That's a good question. Uh, we got part of it in um, in uh, digital currency, uh, so we're just gonna hold on to that. Um, I'm forgetting the name. Uh, uh, we got part of it in Mobile Coin. 
um, which was super interesting because um, their team presented it to us and their coin is quite uh, unique in the sense that it's um, importance towards privacy and uh, privacy of data in general um, it was really important to their project. So uh, for most of it, we'll just hold on to it and see how mobile coin goes in the future. So we have another question from Camille. Uh, thank you for the presentation. What does the future of for FLSC? Will there be another exhibition at some point? Yeah, definitely. We actually um, really excitingly uh, we're, uh, we're got two grants towards our next exhibition. And this exhibition will be more heavily focused on my research project that I described to you. It will kind of continue the conversation uh, uh, after Black Experience is it, isn't a spectacle, but it will uh, focus more on eroticism and depictions of nudity in African cinema, um, as this is kind of what my brain has been tackling for the past year. Um, so yeah, we're really looking forward to it. And we're really grateful because um, we submitted two grant applications uh, with Montreal and with Quebec on the uh, city on the municipal level and on the provincial level and uh, we got a lot of support so we're definitely excited for the future yeah perfect <laughs> <laughs> so, um any other questions i don't see oh oh yeah we answered that. Okay. But yeah what is nice in terms of projects yeah we just described it yeah uh so i think Perfect, yeah. Um, so I think that sums up everything if we don't have any. Uh, there's another question by Max Harvey. Thanks, Max. Uh, speaking on the possible accumulation of images and knowledge on the site, do you see the website mutating as more materials appear? Just mention something along those lines. What could it be? Uh, do you see the website mutating as more materials? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because, you know, uh, uh, I really want to change the structure of the database as it grows because the need might come at some point. And I really want to also uh, decentralize it in the code, um, which I didn't have the knowledge when I first started the, the project. So currently it's, uh, it could be more in the, it, it could be more decentralized and, uh, and have a bigger database for sure. And uh, everything's possible at this point and uh, we'll see how it goes, but there's a lot of different avenues in terms of structuring the database that could be very interesting. Uh, yeah, very good question, but I'm not sure at this point what would be my next move in terms of restructuring the database because currently the engagement is not, uh, we don't have that much traffic, but once the traffic maybe uh, uh, level up, uh, we might need to do some restructuring of the database for sure. Um, and yeah, this, this centralizing the database would be a main goal of the restructuring. Awesome, thanks Jess. What is the role of white spectators of your work? This project seems created for black viewers, but does it ever make you uncomfortable that the potential exists for this to become an object of white spectatorship? How do you protect against this? Um, that's a good question. Um, our exhibition, debuted in Montreal and that's a, this is a multicultural city. There's people from all backgrounds who came in, um, but kind of as I was saying, the goal of, of this show um, protects, uh, be, through counter visualities, it protects spectatorship um, of an intruding gaze in any case, because the, the real art of the show are books. So people come in to, to read Black cultural productions, uh, to sit in, in, in embodiment of uh, Bantu 
uh, architectural design. And even when they're encountered with visualizing the black body, it's, it's um, uh, deconstructed, it's um, through Jess's style and his work. Um, we never really put um, the black body in any way that is has a fetishistic approach, I would say. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, within how the show was conceptualized in itself, um, spectatorship is challenged and you're mostly spectating your own thoughts because you're engaging with books. But also the art pieces uh, exhibited at Black Experiences and the Spectacle is uh, to create also public dialogue. So uh, yes, uh, uh, we're talking to Black people, but as, as like, uh, for example, Rachel singing about love and et cetera, you might wrote it, write it for Black women, but then why people get to listen to. So in that sense, uh, yes, why people might view the work and uh, don't really get the, what I was trying to say within, within the art piece, but uh, the work is mostly to be understood by the people that live those experiences. And from those people that live those experiences, we're inviting people that might not have lived those experiences to not, uh, to not see us as a, spec as a spectacle, but engage with us. That was something that was really important, right? Yeah, definitely. We hope that answers your question, Daniel. Thanks. Um, so much cultural curation today happens on platforms owned by big companies, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Is there a specific reason you chose to focus on a book and website for this archive as opposed to these other platforms? That's a good question. Um, our, our website is independently coded. Um, and yeah, it was definitely really important to us for it to kind of have just doesn't really like when I say this, but a dark web approach, um, kind of like an underground network is what we're trying to create. So yeah, we definitely want to stay away from those uh, big platforms. I think even our presence on social media is quite reserved and subtle, um, kind of matches our personalities as well. Mm. Um, so the goal of Afilasi is not necessarily to garner any form of cloud on social media platforms, um, but to kind of go slow and steady. And, um, you know, we, we truly believe that the people who will engage with it um, with true interests will, will find it. Yeah, because we are we're also very hopeful that people engage with the platform uh, with uh, honesty and being genuine. And from the starting of this uh, platform, every interaction we had were very uh, genuine and honest. And um, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a gem on the web, you know, explore it and please post a genuine extract whenever you have time. Hope that answers your question. I think, I think that, that sums up the questions, right? Um, that may be it for as much time as we have um, for the evening. Um, well, just wanted to thank you all for your generosity this evening. And, um, and I also wanted to, I guess, uh, say again, thank you for coming and joining us in the presentation down in Miami in person. I think that um, this was a really special experience also in just witnessing the multiple formats of this project if, uh, as a exhibition that was discussed this evening, the um, kind of various iterations of this living library and archive um, and also the leaflet that that you uh, had produced and, and shared with um, for you know for multiple days with with the audience of, of the fair and really kind of spent so much careful thought and time in, in discussing this project um, with us. Uh, 
just want to share so much thanks for for that and um and and also to harley you know we were um we didn't necessarily give you all a lot of time you know in when this project uh when we had this opportunity for this grant and kind of to initiate this project and uh we're just you know really thankful for this you know sharing this project with us and expanding it alongside um with us and um yeah and just uh yeah thank you so much thank you thank it's you been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you thank you harley nice to see you again all of you thanks again to everybody for joining us this evening and please um uh keep uh, uh, stay tuned for the next uh, Tuesdays of, of uh, exploration of these digital publishing platforms with um, artists as part of this project series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye.